afternoon. Thank you, Diana, Peter, and Maria for the introduction to this uh, to this today event. Um, I thought to say that, that I will talk about the collectivization of anxiety. Um, this topic is relatively new to me. It's kind of work in progress, so be free to uh, suggest anything. And I hope that I will at least give some inspirative thoughts for further discussion. So in this presentation, I will offer an account of how anxiety is collectivized in community. By doing this, I will treat anxiety of community as relational and situated social phenomena, strongly dependent on interpersonal relations between members of the group. Particularly, I address how collaborative spiraling and reactive attitudes between fellow members are necessary constituents of collective anxiety. In the first part, I will present a general account of anxiety as relational situative phenomena, relying mostly on Dylan Trigg research. After Rice, I will rise on tops about how anxiety could be collectivized, and I will try to offer a model of collectivization. My presupposition is that for anxiety to be collectivized, at least in a kind of societies as Western societies are, we have to have several interconnected interpersonal protocols. Uh, blurring dispersion and overgeneralization of dangerous objects, collaborative spiraling of irrationality, and reactive, strong reactive attitudes between the members which enforce sanctions reactions. The third moment, reactive attitudes towards the fellow members of the group, as I will be disclosed the normative basis of anxieties of communities. And in the final part, I will just suggest what can be learned if any of my presuppositions are correct. So generally, anxiety is treated as some way connected to the fear, but not the same. Some, some, some authors thought that there is a distinction, which is clear, but what is most obvious is that fear has very concrete, dangerous objects. And unlike fear, anxiety doesn't have determinate objects. However, that doesn't mean that anxiety is not intentional mental state related to the world and to the others. As a mood, anxiety colors the world in such way that potentially every object could be dangerous. There is always already a place for dangerous object or to use a shall term, empty slots. Rotation. What marks out un unfocused anxiety is that we cannot designate an object, but this does not show that emotions are not essentially related to objects. For it is not just that there is no object here, rather there is a felt absence of object. The empty slot where the object of fear should be is an essential phenomenological feature of this experience. This anxiety rather consists in countless number of empty slots from dangerous objects or situations which constitutes the relation to the world as well to ourselves. As such, anxiety is often addressed as philosophical mood par excellence by Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Sartre, Levinas, and so on. Most remarkably, because it reveals the difference, the relation between self and non-self, which is usually spontaneously forgotten in everyday things. Thus, Heidegger claimed that anxiety revealed being as the wall, or indeed well designed as such. It is also have to be noted that from a clinical perspective, anxiety paralyzes relation with the world, and even to some degree with our body, and eventually reach to a strong hormonal reaction uh, compared with a primordial fight or flight reaction where a person who is suffering anxious attack have to either quickly flee to safety or encounter the situation as if it, her life is in danger. I will try to explain some methodological presupposition which I will use for the rest of the presentation to treat anxiety as a relational situative phenomenon. Most of all, I'm going to work on Dylan Trigg on phenomenology of anxiety, but also this new phenomenological work on anxiety are it's not Don Trick is working also Thomas Fuchs, Stefano Micali and so on. So but then to, I will first address not situated accounts. So also Heidegger Heidegger's account is phenomenological and essential is kind of not situated accounts. Characteristics of Heidegger descri describing anxiety is placelessness, anxiety is nowhere and everywhere and already there. In other words it's not situated in a space. Disembodiment, not only Heidegger misses to address body expressivity in the case of anxiety, also because anxiety is such a mental state that makes the world slip away, so we see that not bodily situated in the world. And it's individualistic, not only Heidegger non mention interpersonal relations, but the other is also slipping away together with the world. 
Also, a clinical cognitive account and somatic approach is some way means to unify and situate body and cognition in case of anxiety. Psycho physiological examination obviously emphasizes function of the body, but without relating it to the cognition or situation. In cognitive accounts, constitutional anxiety explained it three stages, this uh, 20th century account or even less fall. Uh, so first, there is a false belief about the degree of danger, and this belief is accompanied by bodily sensation of dangerous ventilation, loss of control, panic, and so on. And then such subject misinterprets the situation by focusing on bodily sensations. The second stage is the once that this bodily sensation became a focal point, subject apply behavior mechanism to avoid place the situation which could produce such unpleasant situation. And in the third stage, there is a habituation of these behavior mechanisms. And this presupposition also works well-known cognitive-based behavior therapy. The idea is, of course, that once the belief is corrected, it could make so-called cognitive restructuring and take rational control over by the person that could take it. Note that in that situation, the idea is that rational, rationality should confront, con, confront with the body and that the body and cognition are not treated as unified experience. And the, the third stage is particularly important for the account because it, it explains why the person who ra rationally realizes the situation is not dangerous still suffers panic attacks. Cognitive explanation is because of habituation of behavior mechanisms. So what does it mean that anxiety is relational? Take an example of gephyrophobia, that's fear of the bridges. My, my way of addressing it is to ask objectively about the bridges. So do they somehow emit anxiety? Would other people find it dangerous? And so on, and obviously not. The other way is to address what is in the head of suffering person. Does she find bridges dangerous even not exposed to the bridge in her experiences, and so on? And the other, the third way, which for me it seems obviously correct, I am him uh, holding on the long streak. Explanation is that the anxiety is strictly spoken neither in the subject nor in the bridge, but in the relation of the person to the bridge. This relation is multidimensional. It includes not simply the relation of the cell to the bridge, but also the relation of the body to the bridge, how body reacts. Then relation of the cell to the body, a finally interpersonal relation, including staring of others at her while she is trembling or trusted person who helps her to overcome the situation. This also reflects the way in which anxiety is situated, experienced especially bodily and intersubjectively. This anxiety especially situated means a special structure is framed by anxiety. Generally, it's always treated that a special structure in anxiety is first there is spatial fragmentation. In this example, a uh, person suffering from agoraphobia fragment the space from one tree to another, and the centrality of some safe space, metaphorically spoken, home. Because the most of these arguments are for tropophobia, I did not particularly address speciality further, although I think it could be important, the same structure you could find in social anxiety, which is not uh, tropophobia, and also it's obviously that an anxiety of communities we are thinking about fragmentation of space and safe space. Or home. The body is how anxiety manifests itself. So, like anger or pleasantness in some situation have its expressive manifestation, so anxiety has its expressive manifestation, like in the, the, rigid, the rigidity, rigidity of legs. And if my legs would not move on, I would freeze. And not only that, the body is also an object of anxiety characterized by a loss of a sense of self ownership. So body is fast and distant and uncontrollable, and that the patient anticipation of bodily reaction could also trigger anxious reaction. Anxiety is typically explained by ambiguity that body is mine, the my legs, but still distance and like think outside. I don't control them, they would not move at all. And finally, anxiety is intersubjectively situated in two senses. There could be a trusted person, and they're very important for anxious experience. In this example, this is uh, his friend who tried to explain me, uh, making him more comfortable or making these situations more comfortable or even avoidable. And the concept of safe person in anxious situation is very much elaborated in the literature, defined by David Ballow, safe person is commonly a significant other whose company enables the patient to feel more comfortable going places than he or she can be 
can be aided alone or with other people. Usually this person is considered safe because he or she knows about the panic attacks. Unfortunately, this is not the only role, the other in anxiety, they could be and often do amplify reinforce and suicide reaction. It's not only a case in social anxiety where judging of other is primary problem by general, and not only because of the present judging of the other, but just by imaginative objectivation through the lens of the look of the other, the very anxiety that the subject seeks to mask from the world in turn became an object of interrogation for the other person, which could amplify and reinforce anxious reaction. But in case of trusted person and the untrusted person, other person do not only modify the relation that person has to his or her anxiety, but could also transform the felt experience and the relation to the world. To sum it up and to understand the anxiety is to understand this complex situated experience. To quote Alan Trigg, anxiety is neither in one hand nor even in one body, rather it forms an arc in and around the subject and affects everything within its reach. Before we come to the argument about communal anxiety, I just want to mark two more important characteristics of anxiety, which I would tackle in the case of communal anxiety. So, one, the first one is that you cannot simply unbind. You cannot just gain judgment that there is no danger, and then anxiety disappears. It's not that simple, and it's even no doubt for, for the cognitive account perspective. The second one is future oriented circle image accent person suffer. That means that thinking about your anxiety would reinforce anxiety, anxious reaction. It's most obvious in social anxiety. We're thinking about possible embarrassment of having anxious reaction in social interaction makes you anxious about social interactions. So I think that, that if we want to talk about anxiety on a communal level, it looks like they, they should have the same uh, marks as this one. And that, that is something that I will try to explain. So now, finally, I'm coming to collective anxiety. Collective anxiety is a phenomenon which is not only addressed in a public research, but it has also been very conclusively evidented. For example, there are recorded cases of tribes whose members had very strong collective somatic anxious reaction during the quick transformation of their communities. Or the famous case of med gazers, where people in one area started to report series of imaginary gas attacks that happened in Chicago area in 1945, and is obviously triggered by the media. Uh, today we usually speak about anxiety after the September the 11th, anxiety related to the labor market, anxiety of foreigners triggered by the refugee crisis, and so on. Also, there have been various explanations from physiological, which focuses on somatic reactions, and they're talking about collective hypnosis, and so on, and also socio-psychological cognitive explanation, explaining social mechanisms beyond it, and so on. So from philosophical perspective, there are some problems when you want to talk about how anxiety is collectivized. So generally, practically all philosophers talking about anxiety say that it is absolutely uncommunicable experience, it's not something you share. But not to go too far, the problem is that you actually don't have objects which you want to share. And it's, to be real, which rational person would buy such an unclear judgment that danger is ever? To be precise, we could speak about collective hypnosis, collective delusions, emotional contagion, and that's the direction in which I do not want to go. Not that I disagree that, that there is possibility of it, but I'm particularly interested how collective or rather criminal anxiety could happen in society with a strong individualistic strive for all and rational decision, individual uniqueness and authenticity, and personal dignity and respect uh, in a world in the Western societies. Moreover, this type of personal dignity and respect would be addressed as a constitutive part of communal anxiety in my further argument. And again, I will address how in common anxiety um, this mark arrives. So, how you cannot simply unbind and how you are entering a future oriented circle. So, to start, how we all speak about collectivization of anxiety. This is a model of affect norm relation. This work in progress currently in the Institute with some of my colleagues. Uh, basically, it shows how starting from sub affective reactions, collectivization and arrangement through the articulation, uh, both norms and affective reaction in, is changed. Um, so the preposition is the whole process starts with some more concrete experience, which is much easier to share. Fear focuses on some accepted danger. 
However, the way how the collectivization and particular articulation of it to the media, politicians and so on is undertaken, it finally leads to anxiety. So, presuppose that it starts with marking some dangerous, fearful situation. It could be some rape, possibility that you could lose your job, or the fail of empire state building, something like it. In that situation, it could be understandable that this fear becomes shared between members of the community. However, this is not enough to ampl for amplifying criminal anxiety. It could be just kind of collective fear, which is rational. What is necessary is that there is some kind of blurring of what or how is dangerous, which is usually goes accompanied with dispersion of dangerous subjects. And this is what usually politicians and media do, giving unclear or confused information on what actually is going on. And then it commonly leads to the overgeneralization of objects of danger. For example, then objects of danger are foreigners, establishment, and so on. Now again, the question is how a large number of rationals and individuals could buy this story? The answer that I'll be used is from Thomas Santo in the concept of collaborative spiraling of irrationality. Collaborative spiraling happens when two or more persons engage in collaborative actions, and the way how they engage in it or how they are organized as a group reinforce individual irrational or autocratic reactions. One of the type of such act actions, actually a paradigmatic one, is group thinking. It's important to make distinction between collaborative and mutual spiraling. Mutual spiraling happens in situations when two persons share situation and probably experience of it, but are not engaged in any kind of collaborative action. In this case, the irrational or foul judgment of one person could reinforce irrational or foul judgment of other. But main difference is that in mutual spiraling once an agent gain correct judgment and control, he is not in any way responsible or pressed to hold the same judgment as the other. On the contrary, in collaborative spiraling, the actual problem is the potential conflict between individual rational evaluation and group organization and emotion regulation, in which if there is a strong group identification, group thinking will overcome. For example, take a clinical therapy group of people who are attending meeting for quitting smoking. And obviously they are attending it because they all want to quit smoking. However, many members of the group finding it hard to stop, thus reinforcing other members' Socratic reactions, so telling, oh, it is impossible to stop smoking, this last cigar was so good, and so on. And it eventually happened that it became kind of group ethos that is hardly possible or even impossible to quit stopping reinforcing that you actually would not do it. And even finding participants who reported that they are successful in quitting smoking as outsider who there is the group. In this case, all persons have rational evaluation that they should quit smoking. That is why they are coming at meetings at all. And this rational in, a, a, evaluation of individuals has not succeeded to be a part of group evaluation. On the contrary, group ethos presses the participant to act contrary to their own rational evaluation. And now the third step, which I think makes things particularly hot, as they have to be hot if you want to talk about criminal anxiety, uh, that are strong reactive attitudes such as blame and prize, resentment, trust and mistrust. And this Ben Helm definition here. The reactive attitudes are emotion distinguished by their forming a distinctively interpersonal pattern of rationality. In feeling the reactive attitudes such as resentment, one holds the wrongdoer responsible by calling on him to feel guilt and the witnesses to feel disapprobation or indignation. This call and its uptake are made intelligible to the community members' joint background commitment to the value of the community and its norms, and to the dignity of its members as members, a commitment undertaken and reaffirmed in their reactive attitudes. The resulting interpersonal rational patterns of reactive attitudes constitute their joint recognition respect for its norms and for each other, as a part of their joint reverence for the community. First, this kind of interpersonal reaction is what makes criminal reaction stronger and what produces pressure and binding on community members by calling on them. And what is calling on is what is called on is their own responsibility, dignity, and recognition as community members. So more individual dignity and judging of others is significant for some community. So 
Como you could have reinforcement of common alongside even there is a situation of collaborative spiral. Then these are not only negative reactive attitudes which could reinforce common anxiety and produce this pressure. Also trust put pressure and calls on members. Best example is therapeutic trust or trust that mother give a teenage daughter that she will came not so late in David and actually not believing her but putting pressure on her that she is trusted to come at a time. And this is the kind of entitlement that put pressure on you and there's something that for, for example is very successfully used in a third drive. So give someone trust and entitlement and he will be pressured to do so. And through these interpersonal patterns manifest communal norms and respect and commitment of the members to religious norms. And what is important, this is an old argument by Margaret Gilbert, you cannot imbibe from joint commitment on your own. Without community acceptance, you could abuse them, like a teenager abusing norms, but still you'll be blamed, fall on, feel guilt, and so on. So both the Hilbert and Helm at the end give some arguments how it's even possible to imbibe from common norms, and I will not address this question particularly here, but what they it's not simple, and what they both agree, the only way, even if you success to go out of this norm, that means that you are successful in going out from the community, moving away. It is not, a, and there could be another case that you abide from a communal norm and still stay as a respectful, responsible member of this community. So I think when we talk about common anxiety, it's only logical when anxiety is spread over the community in the form of reactive attitudes, patterns of interpersonal relations. For example, distrusting or blaming members of your own community they talk to foreigners or move to the part of the city which is not ours. And that is what makes criminal anxiety in a way situated in an interpersonal relation or in some way embodied. Coming to the conclusion, I started with the idea to explain criminal anxiety as situated phenomena. As you can see, the core of my argument is that Communal anxiety is situated in some way embodied in patterns of interpersonal relation, particularly in reactive attitudes. It also could be understood as a space situated, fragmenting the city in there or our part, but not going to unsafe places and so on. Uh, this topic is for further research. Uh, I also promised that I will talk you to these two issues, and I address it all the difference. So why you cannot simply embark from communal anxiety when you you as an individual rational understand that there is something wrong with it. And it is, so the problem is that, that you cannot combine from the actual attitudes of communal norms so simply. And it's not only some form or obligatory power of norms, but interpersonal relation in which you are living which bounds. So you have commitment to the way the, you live in community and you live in this community by uh, exercising some way of interpersonal patterns of behavior. And this is what bounds you staying, not staying, but you cannot just go away from it. And if uh, communal anxiety spread over reactive attitudes, that you cannot simply just go for it. It's relatively similar as with the body. So this interpersonal pattern makes you situated. So even if you think that it, there is no danger, you feel that danger in reactive attitudes of our members. And the second characteristic that your awareness of your anxiety doesn't make you less anxious, but on the contrary it triggers your anxious reaction. I think this is the same with the communal anxiety. You being aware that the community you are belonging and you are committed is to is anxious doesn't make expression of this communal anxiety in you less efficient. Doesn't make you purified. On the contrary, you're then aware of the potential eruption of the re reactive attitudes which could arise or your incap incapability to handle it. And all that makes your perception of potential encounter even more horrible. So to conclude, to handle common anxiety just by trying to change individual rational judgment and then expecting that cognitive restructuring would do the job on its own is probably not enough. It's not that simple. We probably should to address before all interpersonal re relation and patterns of interpersonal relation in the community and how the group is arranged as a group. Thank you.
So I changed slightly the focus of, of my talk, so there will be less anxiety, I hope, but some, perhaps some more violence. So, uh, in preparing for this workshop, I came across a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine with a quite interesting title. It's called The Violence of Uncertainty Undermining Im Immigrant and Refugee Health. In it, the authors, a sociologist who studies forced migration and a physician working with refugees who are victims of torture and a social work expert, argue that structural violence to which immigrants are usually exposed to is exacerbated through something which they called the violence of uncertainty. This type of violence, according to the authors, is enacted through policies of uncertainty, which aim to create systematic insecurity by constantly changing the terms of daily life. Thus, an example of this kind of violent uncertainty would be to use hospital premises in order to, de to de detain and deport immigrants or members of the family who are turning to the, to the hospitals for pressing healthcare is issues. Uh, the end result is dimin diminished mental and physical health of immigrants as well as diminished trust in healthcare institutions. The text ends with a rather pessimistic note. I quote now. How can you co uh, convince someone to seek medical treatment from a hospital that once facilitated deportation of her, of her sick child? We fear that these challenges will outlive the policies that created them. Now, I totally agree, of course, that uncertainty is connected with violence. But what find, but I, and that this situation is, of course, beyond tragic. But what I found somewhat unusual was this implication that uncertainty should somehow be purged from the social system because it intrinsically increases social inequalities and injustices. And so, in what follows, I'm trying to, I will try to argue that in some specific cases, the way out of these violent acts would some, somewhat counterintuitively demand that we embrace uncertainties, that, that, or in other words, that we cannot get rid of uncertainties, that the social system is incapable of this, and then co to coming to terms with this fact is important for, for us. Uh, and in other words, if you follow uh, Galt, uh, Gatlung's, Gatlung's classical definition of structural violence, on which this paper is, this paper is also citing this as, as, a, as a reference, he says that uh, that violence is present, structural violence is present when human beings are being influenced, influenced so that their actual somatic and mental realizations are below their potential realizations. And so I think that this idea of coming to terms with uncertainty uh, is, is, is important and that, this are, are, and, that, and that our natural urge to equate uh, uncertainty with violence might, might, might actually ruin our chance, chances to detect and develop said human potentials, or in other words, that purging uh, 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 uncertainty would uh, significantly diminish our cap capability of founding a nourishing and peaceful environment. In a, another way of looking at things, which is connected to what Igor said, is that I'm interested to see in which cases uncertainty is inherently violent and in which cases, cases abolition or reduction of uncertainty uh, actually constitutes a violent act. And the, 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 the argument which I will, I will run, I like to run through my arguments and then like, like we will, I hope, have a productive discussion. So the, the, the argument is based on Luke Boltanski's pragmatic sociology and George Herbert Mead's understanding of structure of self. So first, let, let's start with Boltanski. And this is based on a paper which I, me and Marian wrote uh, some, uh, for, for the, for the uh, upcoming, collection. still upcoming collection of papers on engagement. So in his book on critique in 2001, Luke Boltanski on grounds of pragmatic sociology develops a heuristically fruitful distinction between the world and reality. Broadly speaking, his conception of reality refers to those situations in which social uh, uh, actors have, at least to some degree, semantic security in the sense that the contingency which occurs in some particular line of action remains understandable, understandable with the use of all already present vocabularies. As Boltanski points out, and this is a quote, reality tends to coincide with, with what appears to hang together, in a sense, by, by its own strength, and then adds, it is, 
invariably oriented towards permanence, or, if you prefer, to preservation of order. On the other hand, the world refers to the incalculable risk and thus cannot fit into the available schemes of interpretation. And this is again a quote. Something of the world precisely manifests itself every time that an event or uh, experience whose possibility or in the la language of modern governance probability, under quotes, had not been integrated into the pattern of reality. We can thus say that for Botansky, reality is a subset of an infinite set that he calls the world. And this is my idea of infinite set. So, what this distinction, with, with this distinction, Botansky is prim primarily, primarily aims to show that the social change is created on the daily level, since the reality inevitably gets ruptured by the world, as well as that the scope of this change is more or less proportional to the level of contingency or the level of the world introduced into the given social situation. Mm -hmm. This has two important implications. First, according to Boltanski, the already institutionalized semiotic of social action is always trying to absorb these experimental and sometimes idiosyncratic vocabularies generated by ordinary social act actor actors once the world has unexpected unex Effectively entered into the reality of their everyday life. To some degree, this implication falls close to the standard liberal understanding of social dynamics, according to which, during the course of uh, our everyday interaction, the anxiety caused by the fact that the social procedures and conventions inevitably fail us at some point is either rationalized or, provided that the failure was severe enough, put in the crosshair crosshairs of social critique. Surely, the effect of this critique can differ in success, but the overall scope of the change advocated by this type of critique is necessarily confined uh, to being only a modification of mentioned conventions. It is easy, easy to, to see that this pluralistic, uh, particularistic crit critique is always inherently also intersubjective because it is dependent on the already ex existing semantic resources. This is why Unfortunately, it is also more easily absorbed into the social order. Secondly, if the world per per permeates reality in a much more severe manner, then Boltalski suggests that we are in fact moving from these practical liberal quandaries to metapragmatic issues. In these instances of uncertainty, we have lost the semantic resources and found ourselves head to head, so to speak, with the incalculability of Boltanskian world. In other words, the metapragmatic moments occur once we ourselves in a situation, once we find ourselves in a situation which demands that we to a great degree stop following some of the most relevant pre-given rules and procedures of social life and start spotting new patterns of social interaction that the incur incursion of the world has left in our reality. This is more intense, this more, this more intensive attention and reflection on the new rules and conventions which lack formalization is constitutive for any social engagement and, is that in and is, it is in that regard connected intrinsically with emancipation. However, Boltanski is not clear on how these metapragmatic moments are framed, articulated within conc concrete instances of political struggle. Uh, he basically says, that what we need is some kind of existen existential tests which, which are attained through aesthetic experience. In other words, he remains extremely individualistic in, this, in his approach. And what Marian and I tried in, in, in this paper was to find a way how this metapragmatic moments could be framed in a collective manner. And, the and our idea there was to use Gilbert's uh, uh, social ontology, but here, I, I wanted to go to, 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 to investigate uh, a, another way of looking at things, uh, of, of this intrinsically intersubjective collective way of articulating metapragmatic moments of critique by uh, using the Mead's understanding of self. So uh, uh, Mead's, understanding of, Mead's understanding of nature of, of self is quite well known, so I'm not going to go into details, I'm just shortly, uh, I'm just shortly going to re reconstruct some of the main points and highlight some of the important impl implications that are often overlooked. 
Namely, meat famously sells self as an emergent property. It comes about through social interaction. And there are several important distinctions or points that here needs to be made about this seemingly simple claim. First, according to Mead, uh, children first move from uh, 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 the so-called proprietary stage, proprietary, uh, uh, preparatory stage in which they only imitate other people's behavior without any understanding and enter the play stage where there is some understanding of other people's mental states. In this stage, according to Mead, children are able to engage in the process of role-taking, that is, they are able not only to imitate, but also to generate behavior of others. The final stage for me, and this is the most famous uh, uh, distinction that he made, is the uh, game stage in which child not only adopts some specific roles, but also <coughs> understands the relation between different roles that both he and the others are taking within a given social environment. And this is a quote from, from Mind, Self and the Society. The fundamental difference between game and play is that in the latter, the child must have the attitude of all the others involved in the game. The attitudes of the other players, which is, which is the participant, assumes, to, uh, assumes, uh, assumes organized into a, in, into a sort of unit. And it is that organization which controls the response of the individual. If we put it to, to, to if, if we wanted to formulate this in, in somewhat more modern terminology, means play stage entails that the child is aware that the social roles are coordinated in some way, and this is where it is also similar with 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 the the, the common knowledge account of, of social interaction that was introduced by David Yule, David Lewis and Margaret Gilbert also. Now, the second important point of differentiation pertains to the very structure of selfhood that comes as a consequence of this transition from play to game. Namely, in the game phase, we are able to comprehend role-taking as an abstraction. And this unity, which is constitutive for the formation of what uh, of the self meet calls the generalized other, or to quote him yet again, the organized community or social group which gives to the individual his unity of self may be called the generalized other. The attitude of the generalized, uh, generalized other is the attitude of the whole community. This is a brilliant quote because he is basically connecting individualism as, a, as, as some sort of, of inherent communality. With, he finds inherent communality within individuals. Now, let's try to, to, to unpack this a little bit. For example, if we are playing basketball game, badly, I might add, at the last Mondial, so uh, the generalized other would be the team itself. Now, of course, you have your own game plan. You have to account for the game plan of other people, of other your teammates, but you also have the team as something which is constitutive for your you know, bravado of, of, of your three-pointer or whatever. So, uh, the emergence of the generalized other simul simultaneously produces the me aspect of the self, which basically reflects the attitudes of others towards us. So these are my teammates, how my teammates see me, and in turn, the I aspect, which is intrinsically individual, more idiosyncratic, this is I'm going to do this, I'm going to you know, shoot the three-pointer or whatever. Uh, and, this, and this is the point that is really important. The me aspect is always closer to the reality of Boltanskian distinction. So me is always situated within you know, given uh, social order, within given social norms, within given vocabularies. On the other, ha on the other hand, because the I aspect, which is, and, and I cannot stress this enough, it is, it is not the I of the you know, uh, utilitarians. It is an I which is simultaneously an emergent property based on intris intrinsically collective behavior. So this is, a, this is an important thing to, to have. I will stress this perhaps a couple more times. <laughs> uh, and uh, because it is more uh, idiosyncratic, it's more closer to the world to the world of uncertainty. And now, let's see, I, I, 
I don't have um, uh, the fun diagrams as you go, right? Uh, so this is basically the, the distinction. So you have the generalized other, which basically is constitutive for the I and me relation. There are some overlapping, but they are also, they are also, you know, like there, there is the I, the residual I, which is, which is kind of unpredictable. And the, the proportion of this overlapping it can, could vary, you know, depending on the, on the situation. So there are, there are a couple of things to have to, to, that need to be kept in mind. First, when we say that the self in Mead's philosophy is, is emergent, it means that the actual configuration of situation and interaction determines the outcome of the process. Also, in a true pragmatist manner, Mead understands that the structure of the self implies that the goals we give to ourselves, even the most idiosyncratic goals of the I, is always essentially collective. This is the first stressing of it. Uh, that is socially mediated through concrete social interaction. Uh, even though it is important to have in mind that the whole process is abductive rather than deductive in nature, this is this is also the, also not so not so important. But yeah. Secondly, this means that the abstraction of the uh, of the generalized other is in fact context dependent, and it has the potential to remain open to uncertainty and contingency, because it is dependent on, on, on the fact which game we are playing, so to say. Herbert Bloomer, who was, who was a, a, an avid reader of, of, of Mead, said, was, was right in pointing this really well. Obviously, obviously generalized others vary in, uh, vary in they converge, some representing restricted areas of relationship and understanding for far-reaching areas of relationship, even an extended international community. It is important again to recognize that the generalized other need not match social roles as conventionally, so as conventionally defined in society. Generalized others, rather than the <laughs> prescribed social ro roles that fit inside them cost constitute the vital group roles individuals take in the guidance of their conduct. Okay, so now I will try to bind this all together by overlapping uh, Mead's structure of self with Boltanski's uh, idea of, of uh, distinction between world and reality. So first we have this kind of reality-based generalized other and the violence of uncertainty. So this is what that text that I started with uh, was, was talking about. At least this is one account of it. So namely, in a situation where the generalized other is positioned firmly within the constraints of Voltanski and reality, every kind of contingency actually strengthens the habitual me aspect of selfhood. This, me, this would explain why various identitarian claims are so dominant in our, in, in our time. Me precisely is the voice of already uh, present identities, present in the, in the rea reality that are accounted for. In other, wor in other words, lack of, the, lack of adaptability, <coughs> petrification of selfhood, as we can call it, uh, uh, is, is the main reason uh, why uh, the, the Inevitable intrusion of contingent world into reality causes violent reaction of the whole system. Since selfhood is inert and detached from uh, institutional order, the institutions themselves absorb the contingency and thus uncertainty itself becomes a factor that exacerbates the structural violence which is imminent to any institution. So, the, this would be the first and now, and now the second one would be, so, so the, it, it is important here to see that, yeah, the, the me aspect is much, yeah, that was, that was and, and the, the individual basically uh, 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 is, is reduced to the way that others see, see them. Yeah. So, and this is the other, this, this would be the world-based generalized other and the reduction of uncertainty as an act of violence. Now, if we saw that Mead's idea of generalized other is basically open to the, towards the world. So if we envision that the generalized other, which is again constitutive for the I need the dynamics, is positioned closer to the uncertainty, closer to the, to, to the contingency, then I think that we have this kind of openness and towards engagement and also to some degree 
uh, we have hope for for uh, uh, emancipation. As we saw, one of the main points of me is an understanding of, of selfhood is uh, that it cannot be basically close to, 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 to uncertainty. Uh, and another thing that is, and I will close with this, I hope that I, yeah, I can close with this. Another, another tip to, can, to, thing to keep in mind is that, um, is, uh, is that if this inherently collective generalized other is, is positioned in, in this way, then uh, the I aspect, the idiosyncratic I aspect, would be somehow, and this is, and you can, Marian, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, connected to what Honneth says that I is then seen, not, not something which is individual, but dependent <laughs> upon others, relationships with others, and also relationship and openness towards contingency. So it's just a thought. And and this is actually why I think that 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 why we need to be uh, caution, uh, why we why we need caution when we are speaking about uncertainty uh, as something which is <coughs> intrinsically violent. Although the temptations are and 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 then the dangers of uncertainty are certainly not to be overlooked. So yeah, thank you. Okay, welcome, <laughs> welcome to the second panel of our workshop. We will have two presentations, Clara Navarro Ruiz and Olga Nikolic. You will have 30 minutes each for okay. your presentations. I will warn you when you have 10 minutes left, and then if there is a need, you know, two minutes left. Okay. And I want a clear fight. You know. Okay. First presenter is Clara Navarro Ruiz. Her paper is called Against Reductionism, Violence, Social Reproduction and Feminist Resistance. Clara is uh, just about to finish her PhD at the Complutense University of Madrid. Her interests are uh, uh, critique of capitalism and uh, uh, new feminist theory. And I, I guess her presentation will be something around these, these you know, parameters. Okay. As okay. I said, I want a clean fight and the yeah, floor, the floor I, I is Yeah, I feel like I'm in a boxing ring, like somehow, <laughs> like, go fight, okay. Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to, to thank you all for your hospitality. I think we all feel, like, very welcome here, and I, and I wanted to thank you for that. And, yes, I'm going to start the fight. I'm, I'm just going to mention some material conditions on what has been discussed. So, yes, my, my presentation will be about Marxism and feminist theory and stuff like that. So, um, let's start with a, with a fact. It's not a surprise that the images of dime, dime, uh, drowned migrants at the borders, be it in Turkey, as it happened with Ailan in 2015, or the, in the United States, as we witnessed at the beginning of the summer 2019, are not shocking enough to foster changes in Western frontier policies. Moreover, the escalating violence created by this general political behavior uh, we are living with today is also awakening the arise of the most sinister impulses of human nature. The recent case of a migrant boat smuggler who decapitated a passenger with a knife in the front of the rest of the immigrants only because uh, he had drunk the smuggler's juice is a terrifying example. That's something that happened not so long ago in May, something like that. Clearly then, the day-to-day -day manifestations of violence in our society demand a more profound analysis of its causes and interconnections. Especially important in this, in this regard is that we start to consider violence as, as a social, not an individual problem. So in the next minutes, I aim at tackling uh, some of the fundamental characteristic, uh, characteristics of uh, our social economical system, the global neoliberalism, we can say, as well as subjecting to scrutiny some of the structures that make possible its violent mean, means and the violence it inflates, making thus visible uh, its relations with patriarchy and inequality. My, my objective will be fulfilled more concretely through a twofold investigation. First, we will explain briefly the social reproduction theory, which is a line of thought which um, it's interesting because it's, it offers a theory of intersectional scope 
uh, focused on the process of reproduction of our system, and they show how capitalism perpetuates its um, relations of power going beyond uh, what we consider economical, that is, uh, that is addressed on the essential contribution of women and the communities where capitalism is established. We'll complement our account with the contribution of some feminist uh, theories such as Rita Segato, uh, whose reflections is, is expose the specific characteristics and aspects of violence uh, against women and in the modernity, especially the juridical aspects, and I will say in the psychic aspects as well. Um, in the second place, we will also briefly, quickly expose some lines of Veronica Gago's reflections around feminist needs, thanks to which we will understand the need to implement more complex analysis of the present and see in concrete terms how patriarchy and capitalism are inter and intertwined. Lastly, I will mention one case of feminist, of feminist resistance to capitalism, that is the Argentinian Niuna Menos, where my interest is to emphasize its scope, which is based on a multifactorial analysis that takes into account the social reproduction of life. Okay, so the, there are diverse theories we could use to, to explain the interrelations between gender, race, and violence in contemporary capitalism. One of the most interesting is the social reproduction theory, which is an American-Canadian theoretical approach, which, seek, which seeks to renew the feminist Marxist analysis on, of the capitalist economy. Um, let's see in detail some characteristics uh, of this stream of thought. If we speak from a traditional Marxist point of view, as we know, the structure of society is conformed by the existing dichotomy between work and capital. This uh, dualism divides individuals into alternative and also exclusive groups, those who possess the means of production, the capitalist, we all know that, and those who own nothing but their labor power to satisfy their needs, the workers. Notwithstanding the social reproduction theory, analyzes the, uh, society from a more complex scope. The worker who appears each day at the fabric can be considered as something finished, uh, something perfect, about which we should not make any questioning. Um, we must ask ourselves about the network of relations and processes that condition the possibility of her existence, which is always much wider. Um, that, does not, that does not mean a, display, a displacement of the notion of work. Actually, what is disputed is the recognition of what should be considered labor, what should be considered work. At this uh, author's affirm, capitalism has reduced work and labor to what we might instead denominate better as employment, which is productive wage work, performed always for the market. There's something wider. Because in, um, in fact, in the everyday life of capitalism, there is a myriad of activities and works which are likewise indispensable to its correct functioning. All of them, despite their diversity, have in common one thing, one thing in common. They facilitate and determine the reproduction uh, and well-being of the worker, or better, of, of the labor power. And the social reproduction theory seeks to stress those activities, that labor which has been, until now, hidden in the analysis of classic economists and also explicitly neglected by those responsible of public policies. In this manner, from this point of view, we may affirm that the capitalist society is composed always of two internally interconnected but opposed imperatives. On the one hand, capitalism needs to sustain itself on the basis of profit making. The reason why Marxism has insisted that the end in itself of the capitalist society is the so-called accumulation of wealth, that is surplus value. On the other hand, the other imperative any human society constitutes itself on the basis of different processes that warranty their own subsistence. Um, the social reproduction theory seeks to point out and explain this second imperative, which can be denominated as social reproduction. 
Social reproduction thus encompasses those activities that must be necessarily carried through due to our embodied existence, existence such as eating, sleeping, caring for our beloved people and communities. Uh, those that, as Butler has explained, include also institutional structures. As we imagine, the fulfillment of these second requirements um, is not an easy task in, in capitalism. We have already said that the profit-making need of this system is opposed to social reproduction. Uh, the underlying cause is easy to understand as people, and I quote here, um, and I quote here, Arutza and Batataria, because in capitalist societies, people must also serve another master, namely capital, which requires that social reproductive work produce and replenish labor power. It's bent on securing an adequate supply of that peculiar commodity at the lowest possible cost to itself. Capital offloads the work of social reproduction onto women, communities, and states, all the while twisting it into forms best suited to maximize its profits. End of the quote. Um, okay, so, so the last quote does not come from a specific social reproduction theory text. Um, its fundamental uh, core is here revealed. Um, but there, are another, there, there is another relevant um, aspect of this uh, theory, um, and it's particularly interesting for our interest, and it's the fact that this theory sets also as an essential objective um, the establishment of an uh, intersectional theory. That means they assume as a basic task and take all this into account the development of a thorough understanding of the mutual entanglement of capitalism and the different existing uh, axes of, of, of oppression. Okay, that's, that's something important. So on the basis of um, these two fundamental characteristic, characteristics, it is now time to see how these, uh, how the structure explained articulates itself in the present, in our present, in the neoliberalism. Our present the status quo emerges from the mutual connection between the you know, neoliberal management, which seeks to dismantle the policies of working class protection, including the welfare state through um, diverse mechanisms, and the still enduring consequences of the economical crisis of 2008. Uh, the fusion of both elements produces a globalized, unstable economy which is highly speculative um, and financialized. Employment depends either on sectors whose perpetuation, such as fashion or car industries, which uh, puts in peril the, the limits of nature, or on, in the terminology of Freiburg, bullshit jobs, whose uh, legislation gives margin to wide ranges of precarity, temporality, and the legitimation of really unbelievable levels of uh, self-exploitation. Uh, self At the same time, the regulatory structures are homogenized in favor of uh, multinational corporations, setting so the fundaments of what's been called the Lex Mercatoria Empire uh, through increasingly sophisticated instruments like free trade agreements, like CETA or CISA, whose consequences for our rights as workers are um, extremely harmful. Oh, okay. um, considering this picture, the social reproduction theory would say that this, this description is not encouraged, but it, that is it slightly, um, um, slightly, yeah, incorrect, incomplete, better. Because world economy and politics are, yes, composed uh, by these big actors, but, but uh, likewise, they would say, it is also by the relations uh, shaped at home and the communities, as well as composed by the activities of reproduction that go beyond the narrow limits of capitalist employment. Um, further, due to the intersectional character of power, we know that exploitation is closely related to dispossession which is always differentially distributed along the diver diverse bodies in, um, um, by structures of uh, patriarchy and racism. In accordance to that, uh, to that, we must accept as a given that the world labor market is thus hierarchically, hierarchically structured, thus dependent on the economies such as 
citizenship exclusion or precarity security. In consequence, we um, may uphold that we are facing a new exploitation and power regime which is articulated around migration and dispossession, two factors which have um, integrated the capitalist uh, system from its very beginning. And nowadays, the main strategy will be the extension and dissemination of uh, precarious migrant work at the world scale. Uh, data speak louder than, than any reasoning since uh, the free trade agreement between Mexico, Canada and the USA, the NAFTA, was officially approved. The number of illegal workers in the USA has risen from 4 to 12 million. And additionally, according to the International Labor Organization, the ILO, it can be estimated that in 2017, nearly 42% of the world laboring population was working in precarious conditions. And it is expected that this number arises in the years to come. From a social reproductive uh, point of view, this incessant movement of, of migrants um, and the remittances of money to their countries of origin works actually to the benefit of capital. First, because it is a continuous source of cheap labor in the country of reception. And secondly, making possible the subsistence of the new generations of precarious workers thanks to those remittances of money. In many developing countries, for example, more than 20% of the GDP is contributed by these remittances, according to um, the uh, yeah, uh, report of the United Nations. Okay, so um, before we explain how violence relates to, to patriarchy, um, it is to clarify that the main role in these new labor conditions is assigned to women which is important. A sign is now the long established um, term of the feminization of work, which does not simply um, describe the entry of women into the paid labor, labor first, uh, as if we were talking about Rossi the Riveter or something like that. Um, these words actually seek to illustrate the growth of the low paid work at the global uh, labor markets, stressing the incorporation of women to services and care sectors and the development of those new personalized and also ununionized forms of contracts. Um, so from the social reproduction theory perspective, contemporary capitalism is um, intertwined with patterns of gender and race. This has evident consequences for the levels of violence that each person must go through their existence. Violence, and specifically violence against women, which is a fundamental con um, constitutive part of capitalist uh, society, something we can analyze thanks to Rita Segato. Okay, so who is Rita Segato? Yeah, maybe you know her. She's kind, yeah, she's kind of famous. She's um, an Argentine anthropologist that is well known for, um, known for her reflections on, on violence, um, especially her studies on uh, feminicides in Ciudad Juárez. Nevertheless, her slightly earlier, uh, earlier study on rape, uh, carried through different interviews with Brazilian prisoners condemned from, uh, for this crime, for yeah, rape, can be used to make a brief account of the meaning of rape and the sexual violence in the context of the hierarchy of modern power. Um, in this text, Rita Segato affirms that the capitalist modernity must be understood as a political system in which coexist two different, uh, different axes of power, uh, or regimes of power, better. Um, first, there is a pre-modern uh, form of power, which is a status, in which women were nothing but uh, simply an extension of the rights of men. Um, in this pre-modern regime, uh, rape acts could be understood as a form of transitive aggression to other men perpetrated through the body of a woman. However, this model, this regime is not exclusive, but it's always to live together with the second system, which is the modern form of power, where both women and men have become subjects of contract and thus they have transformed in subject of equal formal, always formal rights. It is clear consequently that rape or the appropriation of a woman's body is always carried through 
this frame of the of superpositions of the system, one that elevates women to an equal status of uh, individuality and citizenship, and other that considers women that women should still live under the tutelage of, of um, men. Regarding this, this background, we are now able to, to understand that the reasons of rape acts are not directly related to the individual woman who suffers this crime. As a matter of fact, it is always either directed against a generic woman who is to consider it to, to have gone uh, wild, who would need a correction, or also against other men, men who other men want to defy in their position of power and thus restore their um, so imagine lost authority, or men who other men want to impress, proving their strength and sexual qualities. Then rape, sexual violence against women, must be understood as a form of symbolic restoration of men power under the coexistence of these uh, colliding power systems, patriarchy, which is based in this status regime of power, and modernity, <coughs> whose fundament relies on the power of contract to warranty equal formal rights and citizenship for all people. In addition, the pre-modern uh, masculine status is based on a structure of conquest and competition. That means that masculinity as subjectivity, uh, subjectivity is to be gained in the access, uh, exercise of pure domination and prestige uh, exhibition, which adds to it um, yeah, some danger to it. So, really? Okay. Um, I'll do, okay. I, yeah, I can skip the last part, it <laughs> doesn't matter. So, in the new um, modern context and taking into account the, the prevalence of um, these structures, women are to be considered as a hybrid being. On the one side, they are a subject of equal rights, but on the other, in an integrative part of the symbolic economy of patriarchy. Um, it might be disputed that my account, that this explanation on Rita Segato, uh, helps only to understand or to explain one singular phenomenon of uh, violence, which is rape. But I believe that, insofar as her explanation expresses the importance of the legal subjective structures to bear in mind, uh, her description can be as well considered an explanation of the existing contradictions between Western modern patriarchy and the legal liberal formal structure of capitalism. And I think that's something that must be always uh, taken into account. Um, nonetheless, ah, okay, so I'm not going to be able to, yeah to do the last part, but it's okay. Um, nonetheless, uh, we might still inquire whether there are new characters of violence in neoliberalism to be considered, which is what what we can consider through uh, Veronica Gago. Okay, so Veronica Gago, uh, on more concrete terms and even more frame in the Latin American contest, has freshly analyzed uh, the elements implied uh, on violence against women in, a, in neoliberalism, making clear that violence must be understood as something, as something uh, social. In a new text of 2019 from this year, she explains uh, that the traditional accounts on, on violence against women reinforce normally two essential elements. First, they uphold that there is a line of casualty between the increasing mobilization of women and the more violent answer of men as a form of punishment, so it, it would be like, okay, you're mobilizing yourself right now, we're going to punish you. Uh, and in the second place, she says that the, that, um, the traditional accounts or the usual accounts on violence against women um, uh, reinforce the idea that women alone are unable to stop feminicide, uh, feminicides. Against uh, these ideas, her, hypo her hypothesis is that the so-called war against women, this violence against women, um, is expressed in four ideas, four elements, which are the actual uh, constitution of feminicide, um, which are as well connected internally through the finances. These elements are, in first uh, place, the implosion of violence in households, 
which would be like an effort of the crisis of the social role model, breadwinner man and family and caring housewife, which was still abundant not so long ago. Um, this war against women um, expresses itself um, in the organization of new violences as well, um, which would be a result of the new, newly emerged figures of authority in the poor neighborhoods, um, forms which, pa which have been constituted through the informal, illegal forms of popular economy that have spread in different regions, both in, in South and North. And in the third place, this war against women expresses itself in the dispossession of common land and resources that once made possible communal life, a dispossession which has been generally a violent process imposed by multinational corporations that have eliminated the autonomy of some economies. And in the fourth place, the war against women uh, expresses itself as well in the articulations or uh, in the articulation of different forms of exploitation and extraction and extraction that have its common code in the progressive uh, financiarization of social life, um, always through that mechanism. Um, I'm going to finish with that. With that, but even what not all, all, all factors which have been um, mentioned by Veronica Gago can be universally sized to, to serve as a common frame to, for the study of violence in a wider context, it can be observed that um, here plays in a specific connection, intersectionality, between three elements that I think that are interesting to, to think of um, about violence in a wider context. Um, it is a connection between A, the context of the contemporary world of labor and the current condition of the economy, B, uh, also an articulation of B, the consideration of the different solutions implemented by the population uh, affected by those economic policies, and C, um, the more general context of the different struggles uh, for justice in a particular place. All these uh, factors must be taken into consideration when we refer to the problem of violence. As a result, um, we will be able to, form to formulate concrete situated analysis um, like this Veronica Salvo's angle. Um, in this manner, seeing feminicides as a part of a more complex frame gets us away from this unidimensional analysis which only help either to blame or to victimize the subjects that have suffered or live in violent conditions. Um, if we understand violence as a mere problem of gender, that, that, that will be the, the ultimate, the ultimate um, um, yeah, the thesis of um, uh, Veronica Gago. If we understand violence as a mere problem of gender, women are unidimensionalized by the attack inflicted against them, uh, which transform them, um, transforms them into passive uh, subjects where further the violence is isolated as a singular isolated fact. The elimination of the diver uh, diverse contexts of uh, violence can only end up thus with, um, yeah, with an attitude <coughs> of uh, paternalism or and moralization because when we understand violence as a mere gender problem, the own experience of subjects um, and the context is concealed um, as much as the consideration of the complex articulation in this context of different factors of desire, rationality, and choice implied in their decisions. Um, it might sound rash, but when our uh, interests are driven to a real elimination of the causes of violence, we must understand that there are more factors and responsibilities to be assumed. Actually, we uh, should not be surprised if we find out after an examination that most of the elements that are to change on the problem of violence are actually implies actually society as a whole. And it's um, an economical problem as well, social problem as well, a capitalist problem as well. Um, I don't know if I have more time. You have, I think, four minutes. <clears throat> um, okay, something quick. Just one minute, maybe more, okay? Um, okay, so now that we have seen very quickly this conceptual background of the gender ca character of uh, violence and how it relates to, to neoliberalism, I just wanted to, to mention um, 
one example of feminist resistance which can be interesting because I think it shares um, a similar scope to what uh, Veronica Gallo has express, expressed in, in her text. Uh, um, I'm talking about the movement Ni Una Menos, which is a movement uh, born in the context of Argentina, where financial and debt problems are thrilling and again, uh, 10 years after the famous Corralito, uh, the daily social reproduction of Argentinian families. Uh, the feminist movement has actually been a key actor in the popular mobilization against the public policies. Why? Um, because of two factors. Um, women are being relevant because, um, because of their increasing relevance in our present world labor market and the so-called feminization of work. And in the second place, and this is more interesting, um, yeah, especially in, in relation to Butler, um, because they have uh, somehow um, developed, embodied, and concrete forms of protest. Um, <coughs> their traditional social role as responsible for the social reproduction of, her, of, of, of society makes uh, their public protest a politicization of what has been considered as domestic and relegated to the spaces of privacy. Thus, um, and I quote here Galo and Caballero in a recent text, taking the pots out to the streets, this taking the pots out to the streets, yeah, we can talk later about it, but it relates to the ollas comunes, which is a form of protest when there's some scarcity of food. Uh, it is really common in Argentina that some people start to cook in the street as a means to, yeah, to share the food for all the community. Uh, thus, taking the pots out to the streets it's also making the domestic issues something political, just as the feminist movement is doing. Taking it is taking it outside its imprisonment, confinement, and isolation. It transforms what is domestic into an open space in the street. That is the politicization of the crisis of reproduction. End of the quote. Um, this perspective has been materialized in multiple pro protests um, across Argentina. Argentina where the recent movements against the enormous rise in the levels of debt have caused multiple mobilizations. Especially important was the protest in, the, in front of the Central Bank of um, Argentina um, almost two years ago, where the collective Una Menos organized an action that, that set debt in all its form, public or private, as a fundamental feminist issue. The protest has had a far-reaching effect because it has helped um, um, universalize objectives and aims in the different forms of social protest, both in the Argentinian context, where unions, and this is interesting, unions have assumed the conscience of the feminist movement, and also an, an, at a international level, as in the general strike of care implemented in Spain, for example, uh, a year ago, and repeated this year. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can be finished with that. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. I suggest. Thank you, Clara, for actually saying something about violence, unlike you know <laughs> panelists on the previous panel. Uh, I would uh, uh, rather have Olga presenting now and then wrap it up with the uh, with the joint discussion, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, but I wasn't prepared. So. You, you weren't prepared, okay. <laughs> well, uh, uh, while you're prepa uh, preparing, Olga Nikolic is a researcher here at, uh, at our institute. She's also a PhD student at a very, very advanced stage, so she's about to defend her thesis soon, as I, I hope so. Her, her paper is called Can Polit Political Violence Ever Be Justified? And she's really getting to the point and trying to identify certain acts of violence which might actually be justified. I am anxious to hear more about it. Um, is this my... Okay. Thank you. Um, so, I want to start by noting that the term political <coughs> violence is very broad, which is also why it is so ambiguous. It encompasses all cases of politically motivated violence, broadly speaking, in the literature, the most commonly treated cases under the title of political violence uh, include war, civil war, violent revolutions and riots, terrorism, colonialism, totalitarianism, etc. Mm -hmm. However, in addition to 
large-scale political violence, or sometimes as a manifestation of it, there are also many separate discrete acts on the micro level of everyday interactions that can be deemed violent, even if they are not direct acts of physical violence against another person. For example, political violence can also take the form of destruction of private or public property, mm -hmm. symbolic violence, self-directed violence, also media and social networks now offer new opportunities for psychological political violence in the form of threats, insults, and public humiliation. For the purpose of this presentation, I am excluding from consideration all cases of non-political violence, obviously, as well as many cases of the political. Namely, there are many cases where I think political violence is clearly unjustified. For, for example, when it involves mass murder of the civilians. And in order to problematize the limits of justification, I want to focus on the problematic cases, namely the cases where it might seem that the violence is justified or when we are not sure whether we should even label an act as violent. So, like I said in the abstract, if you read it, I want to focus on the violence as an act of civil resistance or disobedience and the violence of the oppressed towards the oppressor. These are the cases where one side in the political conflict is treated unjustly and must defend itself, or when one side perceives its struggle as a fight for a just cause and a better society for everyone. Kind of, um, no, it's not such a precise definition, but um, it will work. <coughs> so, my presentation will be concerned both with the elusiveness of the term violence as well as with the ethical issue of its justification. My question is, can we define a more or less clear set of criteria for when political violence is justified and when it is not? And mm -hmm. of course, this is connected to the problem of what is and is not violence. Mm -hmm. I will first analyze some arguments in favor of radical nonviolence, then I will mention some counter arguments and finally present a few empirical cases which will help illustrate some of the problems we are faced with when trying to determine what is violence and to what extent it is justified. Probably the most well known argument for nonviolence is the one that violence begets violence and that therefore it is not a proper means of political struggle if the goal is to end violence. I label this the ends don't justify the means argument. And uh, I think this argument can be further divided into two slightly different arguments. One is the causal, causal argument, which says the use of violence, violent means will in fact perpetuate violence. Therefore, the use of violence to end violence is self-defeating. And the second is moral argument, which claims that it is not ethical to use the same means that we want to, or we claim to fight against, or in other words, violence is wrong in principle, it is never a justified means for political struggle. There is also the third group of arguments that the way I see it work more in an ancillary way, that is as an additional reason not to engage in a violent struggle, and these are tactical or practical arguments. The use of violence usually discredits those who use violence in the face of broader public, or it might lead to further repression by the government, or on the other hand, the use of nonviolent methods might demask the violence of the oppressor, etc. On their own, tactical arguments are not sufficient to argue that the use of violence is never justified. Also, one might criticize the causal argument as incorrect. Namely, we can imagine scenarios in which there is an opportunity for the gravely oppressed to end this oppression by engaging in a well-planned operation that involves a minimal and well-targeted use of violence. And the causal argument will not really tell us why we shouldn't engage in violence if there is a reasonable opportunity to end greater violence by a few isolated violent assaults on the oppressor. So the moral argument has the strongest claim claiming that the violence is wrong in principle. And um, such claims can be found, for example, in the Bible, in the philosophy of Emmanuel Levinas, and in Gandhi's political practice, just a few examples. 
uh, the moral argument can only be countered by a different set of arguments uh, that uh, would stress that it is not always morally wrong uh, to uh, commit violence. And some of the most well-known arguments for counter-violence come from Mao, Sartre, Fanon, and Malcolm X, among others. Mm -hmm. These arguments stress that it is not morally wrong, and moreover, in some cases, it might be morally obligatory to resist violence with counter-violence. They deny the strong moral claim that violence is always unjustified, especially if it is directed at those <coughs> who themselves use violence, and if its aim is the liberation of the oppressed. In such circumstances, the oppressed and those who join them in their struggle for liberation have the right and even obligation to end the oppression by any means necessary. Um, okay, so, so much for the arguments and counter-arguments. Um, now I will briefly present three examples of civil disobedience where the issue of violence and its justification is prominent in different ways. The first example consider, uh, considers the Clamshell Alliance. Formed in 1976 in New England, its main aim was to stop the construction of the nuclear power plant in the local town of Seabrook to protect the local coastal ecosystem from possible pollution. They had the support of the significant majority of the locals. Clamshell was organized according to the principle of nonviolent direct action after the activists exhausted the legal means of opposing the construction. They organized several occupations of the building site, followed by hundreds, hundreds of arrests mm -hmm. by the authorities. Um, but they gained an increasing number of supporters after each occupation. They conducted intensive nonviolence trainings to ensure that the principle of nonviolence would be respected. However, the organization fell apart after the issue of the justified use of violence was raised, when some of the more militant participants argued that if the gate was locked, the next time they tried to occupy the site, fences should be cut in order for the next occupation to take place, and also that the occupants should physically stop the construction, and that this was still a legitimate means of nonviolent struggle. Others considered this the violation of the principle of nonviolence because it involved the destruction of property and the and the violation uh, uh, destruction of property and also this physical blocking of the workers. Um, and the movement broke up because there was no efficient way to resolve the internal conflict. The example is meant to show how even in the movement strongly committed to nonviolence, the issue of where to draw the line between violence and nonviolence was critical. Some considered the destruction of property and blocking of construction works as a form of violence, some did not. But even if it was a form of violence, the question is still how, uh, uh, is still should we adhere to such a rigorous principle of nonviolence? So for example, let's say, I think this more or less describes the situation accurately. Uh, the sufficient number of local residents perceived the construction as a serious threat to their community and other nonviolent means of struggle have been exhausted without effect. So why wouldn't it be morally justified to block the threat, even if it involved a minimal destruction of property and physically stopping further construction work? Uh, I believe that this is, in fact, morally justified, uh, but then that would mean that some forms of political violence are actually justified. So. Okay, let me go on to my second example now, mm -hmm. uh, the example of Yellow Vests. Uh, the Yellow Vest movement, uh, as you all probably know, started in October 2018, and the most immediate cause was the planned increase in diesel fuel tax uh, in a government effort to discourage fossil fuel use. However, this placed a financial burden on the shoulders of, of the working class and the poor, especially from rural areas who must rely on their cars on a day-to-day -day basis. Already from the first day of the protest, violent incidents occurred across France, including arsons, vandalism, looting, and clashes with the police. Thousands of people were injured, some were mutilated by the police. Eleven people died in traffic accidents related to the protest because the protestants blocked the, the traffic. The protests were described as the most violent in France since 1968. So I took this protest, protest as an example of a genuine and chaotic expression of anger 
because of the systemic injustice suffered. And I wonder how to judge whether such violence is justified or not. On the one hand, the movement often behaves in a disorganized and irrational manner. On the other hand, many of their demands are legitimate, which is why we may empathize with them, especially since it seems that the government's insensitivity to the problems of the working class has actually led to the escalation of violence, at least in part. Here I would, um, and I would uh, agree actually with Hannah Arendt when she admits that spontaneous rage caused by injustice might be a morally justified immediate reaction, but it cannot become the principle for further uh, organized political struggle. In addition, what this example of the Yellow West is meant to show is that rather than simply discrediting the movement as violent, we should stay uh, aware of its complexity and of the need to distinguish the more acceptable means of political struggle from those that are not acceptable. For example, physical assaults on the journalists are not justified, but can the same be said for the traffic blockades or the destruction of public property? If the latter is aimed at disrupting the unjust system in order to draw attention to the problem. If we take the radical stance on this, aren't we left with a limited and merely symbolic means of political struggle that the government can easily ignore? I leave this question open for now and uh, go on to the third example. My third example is the Serbian movement, one of five millions, that started a series of, for the most part, peaceful anti-government protests in November 2018 that are still taking place every week. The immediate occasion for the first protest under the title Stop the Bloody Shirts was when masked uh, attackers beat up one of the opposition leaders. The attackers were alleged to have ties with the government or at least to have been inspired by the hateful rhetoric used by the government and the president against their political opponents. Even though from the very beginning the protests had a non-violent character and were explicitly directed against violence and oppression of the ruling party, the government representatives use any occasion to accuse the protesters of vandalism and present themselves as the victims of violence. <laughs> For example, the attempt of some of the protesters to interrupt the radio television of Serbia news broadcasting to protest their lack of objectivity in reporting was over-exaggerated in the pro-government media um, as a, as a in, in, an unimaginably violent uh, incident that uh, in, in this attempt to discredit the protest. Also setting up, setting up posters with the message to stop the media lies in public space in Belgrade was interpreted as an act of vandalism and the destruction of public property, etc., etc. So there is a lot of uh, such examples, actually, very similar. Um, and um, and th what this example is meant to show is how even the protests that are for the most part non-violent can be proclaimed violent mm -hmm. through rhetorical manipulation of the facts. Uh, and I think uh, we often have this kind of reversal in the field of politics today where politicians or parties who are denounced for their violence uh, turn the story around and try to present themselves as the victims of violence. Okay, and now this seems uh, a good place to mention uh, what Judith Butler in one of her recent talks uh, sa says that even the completely non-violent activism can be perceived from the perspective of the existing order as violent, but that does not make it in fact violent. Thus, Butler offers a benevolent interpretation of Benjamin's concept of divine violence as the non-violent destruction of the existing order that clears the space for something new. So the important point here would be that the mere breaking of the existing law from the perspective of those who defend the law will be considered a criminal act, will, will be considered violent. But that does not necessarily mean that simply because the law was broken, that act is in fact violent. Mm. I think that's, that's interesting. So, um, okay, now to the three concluding points. My first point would be that since violence is such an elusive term, we need to work on disintegration and specification of what exactly constitute, constitutes each of the many forms of violence. For example, let's take psychological violence, for example. So, uh, so it is important to kind of differentiate between a disagreement, an opposition, a critique, uh, stating the facts that somebody doesn't like, 
So that would not constitute a psychological violence. On the other hand, <coughs> when someone is insulted, threatened, humiliated, etc., that is psychological violence. Also, coming back to the first example, we might ask, is the act of simply blocking the, uh, the actions of, of the other already a form of violence, for example? Okay. I, and I'm inclined to say that yes, it is, in some sense. In a very minimal sense, it is, because we are using force to block someone from realizing their legitimate aims, goals. So, okay, so second point, and this is actually my original concern. This was my original concern when starting to write, uh, was this delegitimizing power that the label of uh, violence carries with it, when the government uses it against the people protesting the injustice of that very government. However, I don't think that uh, the way to go about it is to redefine the concept of violence in order to preserve the label of non-violence. So to, to claim that these protests were in fact completely non-violent. That won't work because in many cases there is a grain of truth in what public officials claim. So yes, there is some sort of violence directed at the public, public property involved here. But I think we should rather, so we should accept that minimal amount of violence can be justified. I think that's the way to go about this. But I also think that we need a grading of violence. Not all forms of violence are equally violent. For example, um, I mean, this might be a controversial example, but even the tree huggers could be called violent in some circumstances because they may be physically preventing someone from legally exercising their property rights. <laughs> okay, we can, we can argue about that. However, if this is to be called violence at all, I'm leaving it open whether it is to be called. It is a minimal form of violence. And the other side of that extreme would be murder, torture, etc. So all the very uh, paradigmatic cases of violence. So one of the tasks that I see for the critique of violence is also to make this grading more precise. We need to specify the levels of violence from the most to the least extreme, because if they are all cluttered under the term violence, they all may seem equally illegitimate, and yet they are not. However, the greatest problem with accepting violence as a legitimate means of political struggle can be described figuratively as the opening of the Pandora's box. Mm. If we say that some amount of violence is allowed, it would seem that this opens the room for all kinds of violent actions to be found justified given the circumstances which might be too open for interpretation. That is why I also think the third important task would be to formulate a limiting set of criteria that would also allow for some amount of context sensitivity to delimit the justified use of violence. And this is a very difficult task. I mean, some of the criteria that I came up with include, for example, first, that other nonviolent means of political struggle should be exhausted in order for more violent means to be considered. Second, the violent means should be vital to the struggle and the aim should be to use the minimal amount of violence necessary. Third, physical violence against persons is not justified. Fourth, arbitrary violence against private property is not justified. Five, simple breaking the law is not violence. That's what I mentioned and before. And six, given the circumstances, certain forms of violence towards private and public property can be a justified means of counter violence against the greater violence of the property owner or the systemic violence of the state. And of course, this list can be made more complete, more precise. Some of the things are maybe not correct, but this is the task for the future. And um, now I want to thank you for listening to me. And um, I'm thank sorry you. I opened uh, a lot of questions. I left a lot of questions unanswered, probably. Uh, but I hope at least the discussion will be interesting. <laughs>